Thousands of times each day, the shrill call of the ambulance siren announces that a life is in danger. Ambulances are now rolling many hospitals with state-of-the-art medical equipment. Onboard decisions determine whether a life is saved or lost. This dramatic struggle has taken the ambulance from handcart to helicopter and put it on the front lines in the battle for life. The prompt and professional care given an auto accident victim is something we take for granted. But it has only been about 30 years since the modern, well-equipped ambulance began to arrive on the scene. Basic medical decisions and some surgical practices, once done only by doctors in hospitals, are now done in the field by paramedics. The equipment and drugs aboard a modern ambulance make it a remarkable state-of-the-art combination of operating room and pharmacy on wheels. These modern ambulances and their crews have dramatically improved rapid reaction medicine. The survival rate of accident victims is 25 times greater today than it was in the 1960s. The history of the ambulance was forged in combat, but the innovations created under fire have always spilled over into civilian life. Many of the techniques that are used in ambulance work were developed in the military because the, there's a, such a pressing need for uh, emergency care on a battlefield. Uh, the military has always maintained the sort of cutting edge of emergency medicine and um, many of the techniques that are developed on the battlefield then were moved over into civilian life. The process of transferring battle-tested knowledge to everyday life started in antiquity as some commanders began to look for better ways to take care of wounded soldiers. We can see improved management systems for the sick and the wounded as early as 1200 BC. And we see it among military generals who, in purchasing a professional soldier class, found it good policy to have a healthy soldier and to take care of that soldier when he was injured. Homer's Iliad mentions the Greeks' concerns. And later, the Romans built special hospitals to care for their far-flung legions. The Anglo-Saxon and Norman invaders and the European knights as they went off on their crusades all wrote about the care and transportation of the wounded. But the fate of those left on the battlefield was grim. If you were a injured soldier, uh, your lot was not good. And uh, for the victorious army, they treated their own soldier with indifference and they treated the enemy by generally dispatching him as they left the field. Beyond that, as a wounded soldier, you were never treated during battle. It was always after the battle that you were treated. A wounded soldier might be left on the field for two or three days. This often meant the difference between life or death. If you think about horse-drawn transport, if you think about bad roads or no roads, then you have a lot of trouble getting evacuation wagons forward, piling wounded in them, and then getting them back to some place where somebody can work on them. This began to change in the late 1700s, when a French military surgeon developed the first organized system of battlefield medical care. For his innovative work as a surgeon in Napoleon Bonaparte's army, Dr. Dominique Jean Luray is often called the father of the modern ambulance. He really developed two concepts. That one was to provide care to this wounded soldier on the battlefield um, as quickly as possible. And the other was to transport uh, the wounded back to the field hospital quickly. And those two ideas, which seem, you know, we think of them as sort of common sense today,
um, were quite revolutionary in his time and really formed the foundation of um, the idea of the ambulance. During the last decade of the 18th century, Leray convinced Napoleon to allow him to put his concepts into practice by establishing a vehicle, ambulance, and a medical corps made up of ambulance teams. He called them the ambulance volante, or flying ambulances. Napoleon's army eventually had one ambulance unit with 300 odd men for every 10,000 soldiers. This is roughly equivalent to today's medical battalion. Interestingly, if you compare his organization of 300 odd men to a, an American United States Army medical battalion, of the few we have left, of let's say the 1980s, of roughly 300 men, his supported 10,000 men, our supported 15. He had 46 officers, we had 46 officers, but his were all physicians. We don't need as many physicians. We have more administrators. We have science officers and so on. Three sergeants in each. It takes a, three sergeants to run 100-man platoons. He had more drivers because he had horses. We have more medical technicians because of high tech. About the same number of cooks, about the same number of uh, people as litter bearers. And in essence, he invented the modern medical battalion. Napoleon and his soldiers admired Leray and recognized his courage and the courage of those under Leray's command who risked their lives to reach the fallen. There is an interesting account by Napoleon in which uh, he says, Leray was on the field night and day followed by his assistants trying to determine whether there was any life among the wounded. And at any hour of the day or night, he would not hesitate to wake my generals out of their beds if his sick and wounded needed comforts and housing and so on. And they were afraid of him as they knew that he would come and complain straight to me. And it's interesting, in Napoleon's will, he left Larre 100,000 francs with a simple sentence. He was the most courageous and virtuous man that I ever knew. Many European countries embraced Leray's battlefield medicine, but the British ignored the importance of the ambulance and rapid care when they joined the French in the campaign to block an expansionist Russia in Crimea in 1853. They carried with them uh, ambulances, ambulance wagons, but these ambulance wagons did not disembark with them at Varna. And, uh, and when they were ultimately left there on the wharfs, there were no instructions as to how, to how to put them together. The seeming nonchalance and unpreparedness of the British doctors was in contrast to the French, who had brought complete medical teams to Crimea. The British had arrived with their marching bands, but no stretcher bearers. What happened in the Crimea is what happens when you have basically a whole bunch of amateurs going to war, and that's what the British Army was. The result was an enormous loss of life. Of the 21,000 British deaths in the Crimea, 16,000 were from disease alone. Nearly one of every four British patients died. When the Times of London and its dogged war correspondent, William Howard Russell, exposed what was happening in Crimea, it created a public furor. The impact of these uh, reports were almost instantaneous, much like television was for the, uh, for the Vietnam War. In an effort to appease the anger, the British government sent a young, upper-class nurse named Florence Nightingale to tend the wounded in Crimea. She's one of my heroines. Because she's a wonderful nurse? No, because she's a tough-minded, logistically organized, mission-operated person. She cleaned up the hospital, she put the doctors to make rounds, she put her nurses in order, and she got results. Because of Nightingale, the British Army's medical system was reformed, and the soldiers began to receive the care they deserved. Probably the best indicator of her impact on the Crimea was that uh, the death rate among the British soldiers in the beginning was 293 
per thousand. By the time Florence Nightingale left 21 months later, it was down to 25 per thousand. If she had been able to wrest control of the ambulances from the military doctors, the results probably would have been even better. The problems of the British Army system in Crimea would not go unnoticed in the United States, where division and turmoil would soon erupt into the Civil War. Before the outbreak of civil war in the United States in 1861, the country had never maintained a standing army of more than 25,000 men. It didn't even have an organized medical system. Nothing had prepared the nation for total war and the needs of a large army. But as the casualties mounted, a phenomenon occurred across the nation. Soldiers' aid became a rallying cry. It became clear that the ambulance would play a major role in the war. On August the 2nd, 1862, Major General McClellan issued the order that would not only establish the ambulance corps, but lay the groundwork for a complete medical system that would eventually be adopted by all the armies of the world. Initially, the introduction of battlefield ambulances had been resisted by commanders who reasoned that the presence of medical personnel on the battlefield would act as a constant reminder of danger and panic the troops. But as soldiers confronted the grim necessity of caring for their fallen friends, they demanded help. Stretchers, litter bearers, doctors, hospitals, and ambulances were immediately needed in the field. Even when ambulances were available, the problem seemed overwhelming. When the American Civil War began, it's safe to say that the American Army, the Union Army, was simply unprepared for war. Now, the Union Army, which had become sort of the, the standard model that's discussed, uh, the ambulances were owned by the quartermaster and they were driven by civilian Teamsters. So at Bull Run, the Teamsters stole the medical alcohol, got drunk, and as soon as the firing broke out, left. So the wounded were not evacuated sometimes for up to two to three days. Bull Run was the first major battle fought. It shattered the North's confidence and clearly showed the need to improve battlefield medicine. 3,000 men remained on the battlefield two days, three days after the battle. And even a week after the battle, uh, there were still some 600 men uh, left to be evacuated. An army doctor, Jonathan Letterman, observed the battle. Like Larray, he had a lot of compassion for the soldiers. He convinced General McClellan to give him the authority to make changes. Letterman's first step was to organize an ambulance system and take it out from under the control of the quartermaster. The quartermaster had developed several types of ambulances. One was the two-wheeled Coolidge, which gave a bumpy, sometimes painful ride. The transportation of that soldier was, um, was tough at best. Uh, these, particularly the two-wheeled ambulances, were, um, were hard on the men. And that became very quickly understood and that they had, in fact, to eliminate those two-wheelers and move to four-wheeled transportation. The two-wheeled Coolidge was soon replaced by the smoother four-wheel Tripler. It could carry 10 men, four lying down and six seated. The Tripler was widely used, but it was cumbersome and heavy. The Wheeling or Rosecrans ambulance wagon was also used. It was lighter than a Coolidge or Tripler and could be drawn by only two horses. The ultimate design was the Rucker, it could carry more men, either sitting or lying down. It had medicine chests, instrument boxes, and seating for orderlies. It was designed to support a surgical team. It became the medical workhorse of the whole war. Here we go. Once Letterman had set up the ambulance corps, he turned his attention to establishing a medical system that would serve the needs of the troops. Under Letterman, 
The medical staff would accompany a regiment into battle and establish a medical aid station as close to the front lines as possible. In the Union's field hospitals, the wounded were received and given their initial medical attention. The regimental surgeon would determine the seriousness of each wound. He would decide which ones needed to be transported up the line by ambulance and which ones could walk. The ambulances were reserved for the most seriously wounded. At the field hospital, the wounded were operated on, if required, by an operating team surgeon. If they were unable to travel, they would remain at the field hospital until they regained their strength. The Union's ambulances and field hospitals were the front lines of medical care and contributed greatly to reducing the suffering of the soldiers. The first major test of Letterman's system came in September of 1862, 13 months after Bull Run. At Antietam Creek, two great armies clashed and turned a sleepy fall day into the bloodiest of the Civil War. It was a trial by fire for Letterman's Ambulance Corps. He has, I believe, some uh, 300 ambulances available to the troops. He also had established some 74 field hospitals, and, uh, and he was able, he had authorization also to control the medical department. Letterman's Ambulance Corps had rushed thousands of wounded soldiers off the Antietam battlefield. But he knew if he could evacuate the wounded faster, more lives could be saved. In December of 1862, just four months after Antietam, a refined system was set to be tested at the Battle of Fredericksburg. He was able to evacuate the wounded in a 12-hour period, and he was able to do this despite skirmishers and uh, sharpshooters who were, who were shooting at the, uh, the litter uh, bearers. And uh, he did this with not 300 ambulances, but now he had 1,000 ambulances. It made a big difference. Letterman continued to refine the systems to ensure the rapid care of the wounded. The speed of the railroad was put to use when ambulance trains were built with large, fully equipped, skylit surgical and patient wards that moved over tracks right to the front. Riverboats on the Ohio, Missouri, and Mississippi rivers were converted into floating ambulances so the wounded could be evacuated from the front and sent to large hospitals in the rear. At Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Gettysburg, the ambulance and hospital corps proved their worth. Letterman's concepts were adopted by all the armies of the world and remain largely in effect today. In other words, this is a guy who thought modern management systems. Never uses the word management, never uses the word system except differently from the way we do, okay? But what he built in those things I've mentioned is exactly what the American army does today. The Civil War had extracted a terrible penalty from the new nation. The cost, 364,000 lives. But some good would come from the lost lives and the destruction. As calm settled over the land, the advances in the development of the ambulance that had saved thousands of lives in war we're on the verge of doing the same in civilian life. A welcome peace settled in following the Civil War, and communities across the US and Europe began using the Rucker ambulances, as well as others developed by the US Army. The Rucker, popular in American cities because of its battle-tested sturdiness and efficiency, also began to gain favor in Europe. In the late 1860s, it won a prize for innovative design at a Paris exposition. In the States, hospitals created ambulance services. The first was launched by New York City's Bellevue Hospital in 1869. It included a surgeon who traveled with the ambulance driver to the scene. 
they began to use a new phrase, first aid, coined by an English ambulance service. The term first aid was uh, invented by the uh, Order of St. John and the St. John's Ambulance Association um, to mean the care that these civilians would, uh, or lay people would provide before the doctor got there. While the ambulance and specialized ambulance services were gaining ground in civilian life, concerns about the need to improve the treatment of soldiers on the battlefield remained high. In 1864, an international convention of 14 nations was held in Geneva to establish new rules of behavior and standards for the treatment of the wounded during warfare. The convention was the idea of a wealthy young Swiss man named Jean-Henri Dunant, who had seen the effects of a battle on the French and their opponents at Solferino. He came upon the last hours of that battle where some 16,000 French and Italian troops and another 20,000 Austrian troops were lying dead or dying uh, in the field. Dunant was uh, horrified by what he saw and he spent over a week afterwards organizing people in surrounding villages, civilians, to go out and care for these men who were just still lying out on the battlefield a week later. Shocked by the absence of battlefield care, Dunant began to drum up support for international reform. At the first Geneva Convention, Dunant convinced several countries to grant immunity to battlefield medical personnel. Medics could finally drive ambulances onto the battlefield and care for the wounded without being shot. To clearly set the medics apart, they were to fly a flag with a red cross. And in this Geneva Convention, uh, they basically agreed that wherever the Red Cross flag flew, that the wounded there, as well as the medical support teams that were there, would be considered neutral. While Dunant's Red Cross grew in stature as it became an international relief organization, Dunant fell into obscurity. He devoted so much uh, energy into this cause that he'd, he'd stumbled into that he went bankrupt and he lived for many years in, in poverty and, and uh, neglect until he, he was sort of rediscovered late in his life and he won the first Nobel Peace Prize. While Dunant wasn't recognized initially, his work was. No sooner had the Geneva Convention been certified in 1870 then France and Germany went to war. Both sides respected the neutrality of the medical personnel. The Franco-Prussian War showed that the new civilian medical service of the Red Cross worked. Back in the United States, the American Red Cross watched and would soon be playing a similar role as the country moved toward yet another conflict the Spanish-American War in 1898. Once again, the military would resist modernizing its emergency care. Clara Barton, the head of the American Red Cross, pushed the U.S. Army to try new ambulances. She even purchased motorized ambulances and had them shipped to Cuba. But the local commanders had them sent away they insisted on sticking with the horse-drawn ambulance. One commander even ordered that the horse-drawn ambulances be left behind. Had Spain been a more formidable enemy, the lack of emergency care for American soldiers would have been a disaster. But even Clara Barton couldn't anticipate the horror to come the new weapons of mass destruction about to be unleashed in the First World War would challenge the Ambulance Corps like no other war ever had. As World War I approached, the world's military medical corps were being pressured to give up their horses and carriages and move to the new motorized ambulances. 
World War I revolutionized warfare. It was fought with new machines, munitions, and chemicals, all with a ferocity unimagined by the gentlemen commanders who had ridden into the new century on horseback. This was really the first war on a major scale in which you had the machine gun, the airplane, later in the war the tank, gas warfare, and massive use of artillery. The impact of, of small arms, of artillery, and of uh, quick-firing machine guns really changed the complexion of war. Uh, the consequence of this technology was nothing short of revolutionary. The new weapons created fresh challenges for evacuating the wounded. The heavy pounding of artillery and the deadly accuracy of new guns forced both sides into a different type of fighting at the front trench warfare. These miles of interlinked trenches, full of muck, stagnant water, and rats, became home for soldiers summer and winter. The close proximity of the combatants turned the areas surrounding the trenches into no man's land strewn with corpses. Getting the wounded off the battlefield was a difficult and dangerous feat for the litter bearers. Transporting the wounded by any stretch of the imagination was an arduous task. And um, uh, it meant that stretcher bearers had to be as far forward as they could be without being in harm's way. And that was almost impossible. The, the no man's land was uh, filled with uh, holes and gas and uh, it was a rather unhealthy place to be, as you can imagine. And the mud was, uh, was everywhere. And all of this taxed the, uh, the bear companies. Even when it was possible to get the wounded off the battlefield, transportation to care was difficult. As early as 1914, three years before the Americans entered the war, the French had realized that motorized ambulances were superior to their horse-drawn wagons. But there were two problems. Cars were scarce during wartime, and anyone qualified to be a driver would also be needed in the trenches. France looked to the United States for a solution. Young, car-loving men in search of adventure might be convinced to volunteer for ambulance duty. With any luck, they bring their own cars. They did, by the droves. The first volunteers came from Ivy League schools. As the war progressed, the volunteer fever spread throughout the country. They all succumbed to the romantic image of driving an ambulance in battle. The majority of drivers were organized by two groups, the Red Cross and the American Ambulance Field Service, or AFS. AFS eventually became the most renowned volunteer operation in France. This was partly due to the rugged Model T Ford ambulances that the AFS volunteers brought with them. The driver's memoirs and letters are full of praise for these inexpensive $350 utilitarian vehicles. They all were in love with the Ford, the Tin Lizzie. I mean, it would come through for you. It would make it through the muddy roads. It had that low planetary gear, a whole bunch of it, easy to repair and fix, easy to change a tire, whatever. Uh, dependable, reliable, sturdy. I mean, these adjectives keep coming through. Some had less endearing names for these flivers of mercy. It was called the goat by the French, and the British called it the uh, mechanical flea or the uh, Chinese Rolls Royce. Um, despite the, uh, the, uh, the names that it was given, and, and that was, those were only the nice names, uh, it, it served a great purpose. And uh, over the course of the war, it was used to evacuate more than a half million men. While frontline ambulance duty could be dangerous, some drivers found themselves far away from the fighting. 
Their job was to ferry the wounded from one hospital to another. For those who'd come to Europe for the action, this was an unbearable exile. One who fit this bill was a young newspaper reporter, Ernest Hemingway. To witness events up close, Hemingway and two friends volunteered as Red Cross ambulance drivers. But he was posted behind the lines in Italy and saw very little. Frustrated, he volunteered to deliver cigarettes, chocolates, and candy to the troops at the front. Two weeks before his 19th birthday, he grabbed a bicycle and headed off. A mortar exploded. Even though he was badly wounded, he carried a soldier who had been hit by the same mortar back to the command post. On the way, he was hit by machine gun fire. While convalescing, he fell in love with his nurse, Agnes von Karowski. He couldn't convince her to marry him, but the romance and his wartime experiences were immortalized in his second novel, A Farewell to Arms. By the time the U.S. Army took over the volunteer organizations in 1917, over 3,500 Americans had served as drivers. Some, like Hemingway, E.E. E. Cummings, and Archibald MacLeish, became noted literary figures, but most served with distinction anonymously. There was never a shortage of work. Six nations and 61 million troops had produced 34 and a half million casualties. But finally, the fighting faded away. When peace returned, the Doughboys came home. They brought back with them their experience with motorized ambulances and emergency medicine. Beginning in the 1920s, the civilian use of ambulances started to increase dramatically. Julian Wise, a young man from Roanoke, Virginia, would have a profound influence on the future of the ambulance and emergency rescue. It started by accident. When Julian was nine years old, he was on the banks of the Roanoke River, and he saw a canoe come down the river with two men in it, and that capsized right in front of him. There were men on the banks with him, and they threw branches into the river. They shouted advice. They tried to help the men, but they were unable to. And Julian said he felt so helpless seeing those two men drown that when he grew up, he wanted to do something to be a lifesaver, to save people like that. The tragedy he witnessed at the Roanoke River preyed on his mind. As he grew up, he formulated a plan of action. So he... Um, formed in the city of Roanoke uh, the first volunteer rescue squad and that became a, a kind of prototype for other volunteer squads around the country. In 1928, Wise founded the Roanoke Life Saving and First Aid Crew, composed of a group of friends and co-workers who were all excellent young swimmers. At first, the crew's concentration was river and water rescues. So Wise taught his team how to revive a drowning person by artificial resuscitation. It was a struggling volunteer operation. And they had a first aid book from the Red Cross that they studied. It was less than 100, 100 pages. That's all the training that they had, whatever they felt was most appropriate for the situation. They had no equipment. Wise's volunteers had to beg and borrow everything they had including the bandages they kept in their converted tackle boxes. But as automobile accidents became more prevalent, Wise decided that the organization had to grow. And to get to the accident scenes faster, he would need a motorized ambulance. Wise searched for a donor. And then about 1931, the local funeral home gave them a 1918 Cadillac hearse that they were were retiring, and that was the first ambulance. And they used it to haul the equipment to the scene of the accident. Some thought that a hearse was a strange choice for a life-saving vehicle, but it made sense. 
It was a kind of a natural development because the uh, undertaker in most communities had the only vehicle which was designed to, to um, carry a person lying down. So they sort of picked up the business by default. By the late 1930s, the Roanoke Volunteer Ambulance Service was well established and it was being imitated all over the country. Wise traveled to other cities and advised them on how to set up their own systems. Before too long, communities across the country were being served by volunteer ambulance teams based on Wise's model. The idea spread like wildfire. The brush, the brush. Get it started, get it started. Get when disasters struck, help could now be summoned. By the time the Hindenburg airship exploded in 1937, the New Jersey First Aid Council was able to call 29 ambulances to the scene in Lakehurst. But in the late 1930s, Americans began to hear disturbing news. Storm clouds were brewing once more across the globe, and the nation was about to be plunged into war. Once again, war would take the ambulance to new heights that eventually would benefit everyone. Americans watched the newsreel reports about the pain of the war in Europe. They were moved. They decided to act, even before their country became officially involved. In 1940, as they had in the First World War, these civilian volunteers prepared to embark on a mission to save lives. They unselfishly traded their settled routines of coats, ties, and cars for the uncertainty and danger they'd find behind the wheel of an ambulance. Once more, the AFS recruited most of the volunteers. One month before Pearl Harbor, members of the AFS sailed to join the British and the Free French in the Middle East. Their rugged four-wheel drive ambulances were ideally suited to the rigors of uncertain terrains, but the sands of the desert would try and swallow any vehicle. In North Africa, the AFS ambulances took part in British General Montgomery's great assault against the forces of Germany's desert fox, General Erwin Rommel. The British drove Rommel from the desert, but not without incurring tragic losses. While the British guns blasted away, the AFS ambulances carried the wounded. There were never enough ambulances, but the drivers knew there never are in battle. The ambulance drivers did their job one man at a time. Each mission of mercy could mean the difference between life or death for a wounded soldier. They never knew what happened to most of those they helped, but they always hoped for the best. When America finally did enter World War II, Army medical units were designed right into frontline operations. While the workhorse of the Army Medical Corps on all fronts was a boxy three-quarter ton truck, improvisation was often required. Where the troops moved, so did the medics and the ambulances. The Army medic was now part of every infantry platoon, and an ambulance unit was assigned to each battalion. The combination of new surgical procedures and drugs, and the rapid transport of the wounded to huge, efficient hospital complexes in the rear, vastly reduced death rates from combat wounds. Late in the war, when there were enough planes to dedicate to evacuation efforts, Airplanes began to be pressed into service as aerial ambulances. The planes cut the time it took to get the wounded to a hospital. Motorized ambulances would stand by as the air evacuation planes landed. Within minutes, the wounded were on their way to the next level of care. While trucks and planes played a major role in reducing the casualty rate of World War II, an event occurred near the end of the war 
that would set the course for the future of military and civilian emergency medicine, the invention and use of the helicopter. And the first known helicopter evacuation was April of 44 in the jungle in Burma. So it was an old, uh, was one of the very early Sikorsky models, had canvas sides, and uh, the pilot could only take out one patient at a time and, and had trouble getting the thing off the ground, but he brought out three patients from an area you couldn't get even a light aircraft in. The realization of the full potential of these go-anywhere, land-anywhere devices to catapult emergency medicine forward would have to wait for another conflict. But the wait would not be long. The pleasures of peace were not to be savored. No sooner had the GIs happily stepped out of uniform and into civilian life than a new conflict erupted in Korea. The Korean conflict would cost 54,000 US lives, but many would be saved by the refinements of emergency medicine and the speedy evacuation from the battlefield eventually made possible by the helicopter. After World War II, everybody got interested in the helicopter. And the Marines thought about it, the Army certainly thought about it, and the Air Force began to use it for search and rescue. Many soldiers owe their lives to the ever-increasing fleet of choppers. The motorized ambulance still played a major role in military medicine, but for getting patients out fast, the helicopter was unbeatable. Helicopters became the ambulances of the air. The medical lessons of the Korean conflict would be put to good use again less than a decade later in Vietnam. Emergency and combat medicine got even better in Vietnam. The helicopter ambulance, the UH-1 Huey, became a symbol of hope, an airborne version of Florence Nightingale. During the war, civilian hospitals began to see how the techniques learned in combat could be applied to their needs. The helicopter became an indispensable tool for rescues and for quickly transporting patients and organs for transplants. While progress was being made in the air, during the 1950s and 60s, America's traditional ambulance services were known simply as a load and go. Of the 200,000 ambulance and rescue personnel in the country in 1960, fewer than half were trained in Red Cross advanced first aid. Only six states offered standard courses for rescuers and only four regulated ambulances. In 1966, the federal government acted. It mandated that emergency services had to improve. The familiar icon of the American Ambulance Services, the Cadillac, was about to be transformed. Within a short time, the Cadillac Ambulance was replaced by specially equipped vans driven by highly trained technicians. Load and go was gone. EMS was here. The new equipment and vastly improved training has had a profound effect on society. Thousands of fatalities have been prevented due to speedier and better care. As the ambulance continues to improve, more people will live longer. It is clear that all of us owe a debt to the dedicated men and women who have given their time, and in some cases their lives, in the war against death. Their search for better ways to keep more hearts beating has propelled the ambulance forward in its race for life.